You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi friends, I'm Annie. I live in a small town that's about equidistant between Boston and Salem in Massachusetts. And I'm Johanna, and I'm in the more or less at the moment beautiful Austrian countryside because the weather is not as nice, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is what now, it is. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, do you in fact live on the actual hill where Julie Andrews sang Edelweiss? Because that's pretty, <laughs> that's a nice spot. No, 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 you're mistaken. I live on the second hill left where she twirled around for oh, a the while. the twirling hill. Yes. Also, <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much for tuning in on another episode of your favorite international podcast and for all your support. And as always, we want to give a special shout out to our newest Patreon members. This is amazing. Okay. We have Gloria Tabor, Dory Kaufman, Jill Lang, Marie Bunting, Hey Marie, Clementine Ketchum. That's a great name. Mm -hmm. Jane, just Jane. Thanks, Jane. Brooke G. Hargrove. Now, see, we've swung from one extreme to another, from Jane to Brooke G. Hargrove. <laughs> thank you both. And Serena Henson. And also thank you to Billy Hubbard. And I think the name I had a hard time with last week was Ely Arendt. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And if you out there are interested in joining our Patreon, please listen until the end and we will tell you all about it. Okay. Today, Annie has a case for us that I don't know anything about. What are you going to talk about this week? All right. So I have a case today that I found when I was, I was sort of going down a rabbit hole from a different case. Of course you were. I know, I know. And I don't think I had ever heard about this case before. So today I'm going to tell you about an Australian case. And it was sort of their Lindbergh baby case. It's the case that started Stranger Danger before the Beaumont children and before the Wanda Beach murders. There was the kidnapping and murder of eight-year-old Graham Thorne. It's interesting and it's awful. And it really did change the way a lot of things actually were done in Australia after it happened. It's also some of the best early forensic work in Australian criminal history. Are there any special warnings? Well, we are going to be discussing the kidnapping and death of a child, but I don't think that this is a particularly graphic case. There's no torture, sex crimes, nothing like that. Most of the more detailed information is more clinical background evidence sort of stuff. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. I get it. Okay. Okay. So yes, please yeah. tell us everything. Okay. Come with me back 60 years now. It was 1960. Kennedy was running against Nixon. The top cocktails at the time were the Whiskey Sour, the Sidecar, and my mother's favorite, the Manhattan. It's Now or Never, which was Elvis's interpretation of the classic O Sole Mio, was on the top of the charts, as was Chubby Checker's The Twist, and of course, the Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini by Brian Hyland. So, in Sydney, Australia, the construction of the Opera House was unsurprisingly, maybe, proving to be more expensive than anybody had realized. Originally, they had planned to spend around 7 million pounds, I guess it would be British pounds on the construction of the building, which they at the time thought it would take four years to build. In the end, it cost 102 million and it took 14 years to build. So they were a little bit off budget. Just a bit. Yeah, just a bit. I'm not judging. I'm terrible, absolutely terrible at budgeting. It's a good thing I like grilled cheese and ramen. And I also remember very well driving into Boston during the height of Boston's Big Dig project. That project was literally billions, billions of dollars over budget, so not judging. But yeah, they needed to find a way to make that difference up. And they tried public fundraising campaigns, but that didn't really make much of a dent. And so one of the things that they did, in fact, I think the main way that they were going to be able to raise the money to keep this project going was to hold a state lottery. And they had several of them, in fact. I think that's smart. I think that's a good way. Uh, yeah, I think so too. 
So Opera House Lottery number one, tickets went on sale in November of 1957. And the last lottery was actually in September of 1986. And they raised over 105 million. Well, I guess initially it would have been British pounds. But then by the end, uh, I think in the late 60s, they switched to Australian dollars. They raised a lot of money. They were able to build the Opera House and it was formally opened by Queen Elizabeth II on October 20th, 1973. The grand opening was televised and had fireworks and a performance of one of our favorites, Beethoven's Ninth. It is definitely on the list of things I want to see when I finally make it to Australia. Have you been to the Opera House? In Australia? Uh, Just outside. Didn't have time to get tickets. Oh, good. Well, we'll have to go. All right. So now we're going to go back again to 1960. It is now the 10th lottery and traveling salesman and father of three, Basil Thorne. Which is a great name. Isn't it? Basil. Basil. It's such a good name. I love it. It is. And it's Basil with a Z, with a Z. Whereas in England, I think it would usually be with an S. Yeah. Uh, So Basil, he waits in line to buy the lottery ticket. And the price of this ticket is five pounds. And that amount is apparently, okay. So you know how there's always like these currency converters, but a lot of the time I don't feel like that's, it doesn't always feel accurate, right? Yeah. So they do mention a lot that the cost of a lottery ticket was about a quarter of the cost of an average weekly wage. And so what I did instead was I looked up the average weekly wage in Massachusetts, and it's around $1,100. And a quarter of $1,100 is $282. So that would be buying a lottery ticket for $282. So it's definitely more than your average lottery ticket, right? Here, I think most lottery tickets are $2. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... Do you buy uh, lottery tickets? Uh, yeah, sometimes, but I only play the Euro Millions once in a while because I figure if I win, I want to win big. Right. Like, I don't want to settle for one or two million. I want like 105 no. million euros. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, no, we're kind of the same. And I always talk about all the great things we could do. Well, you see, if you're near the Facebook group, it's like, if we win the lottery, I'm going to buy this Victorian mansion and turn it into a dog sanctuary. (laughs) But you have to play to win. I'm never going to fulfill my dream of living in a weird old mansion with acreage and all the animals unless we buy lottery tickets. And in this case, the prize was £100,000, which... Somewhere between three and five million dollars in today's money. It was life changing Mm. money, right? Like three million dollars, that is life changing money. I'm not sure that a million dollars is life changing money anymore. I guess it depends on where you live. You know that thing where you read about a lottery winner and you find out they're really nice people who could really use the money. Mm. And so you just get those warm fuzzies. Like you're bummed you didn't win, but you're like, oh, that's nice. These really lovely people won. Unlike, I swear to God, there was a story. Now I'm going to say not long ago, but I feel like I've reached an age where I say not long ago. And that could mean minutes or decades. Um, <laughs> who can say? But somebody had won and it was like, They had won a couple of million dollars. And I think it was their third win of over a million dollars. Do you know what I mean? Uh, And it was like, we get it. You're very fucking lucky, right? Like, give someone else a break, Lucky McLuckerson. (laughs) Try to find a fucking pair of attractive wide with shoes. Good luck. See how lucky you are then. (laughs) I'm not bitter. It's fine. But this is a nice family, the Thorne family. And so when they win, we are happy for them. Let's talk about them a little bit, just briefly. And I say briefly because... Some of this family is still very much alive, and so I'm really trying to walk that line of just maintaining their privacy while also discussing something that is unimaginable and really very deeply personal. There are a lot of sources for this episode, and once again, I encourage you to take a look at the source list on Facebook. We're also working on getting it up onto our webpage, and you can always message us if you ever want a list of our sources. Um, It's a lot of good reading, but there was especially a 2015 article by Mark Tedeschi and a 2019 article by Helen Pitt. Those were both for the Sydney Morning Herald. There'll probably be others as we go. So, okay. Basil Thorne was born in 1922. He was the only child in a family from Rose Bay. During World War II, Basil was stationed at a prisoner of war camp in, I think it's Cowra, C-O-W-R-A. Cowra could possibly, probably have its own episode. So this Japanese prisoner of war camp, it had the largest and I think the bloodiest escape attempt of any of the prisoner of war camps during World War II. And that took place in 1944. 
A lot of the Japanese prisoners who died did die by suicide. It was a really devastating event. There's now a Japanese cemetery as well as a garden and cultural center there. But again, that's a story for another day. I don't know if Basil was stationed there yet when it happened, but it's in Kaura that he met his future wife, Frida Thorncraft. Frida was the oldest daughter of parents from the Kaura area of New South Wales, and she often played the piano at local dances, which is, I imagine, how they met, but we don't really know. I do know that their engagement was announced in the newspapers in November of 1946. Once they were married, they settled in Sydney, and Basil worked with his father as a traveling salesman. I guess work as a traveling salesman in the 40s and 50s was a pretty good living, Mm. but as the 60s came around, it was less so. It was really a lot of hard work, and he was away from his family a lot, and there wasn't a lot of financial reward for it. You know what I mean? I think it was really hard work for not the best wages. And things would have been tight for them because their firstborn child, Cheryl, we don't know exactly what the issue was, and it could be any number of things. She's described as having been born with a serious disability that required she live in a special institution. This was really common at that time all over the world, uh, not just in Australia. And again, that's probably a story for another episode, but it was absolutely a difficult situation for parents who love their daughter very much, as it is for anyone who has ever had to make the very difficult decision of just realizing a loved one can't safely or practically live at home anymore, that's tough. And there's a lot of reasons why that might happen. It's a terrible thing to have to go through. Their next child was Graham. He had two middle names, one for each grandfather, and he was born in December of 1951. And then their youngest daughter, Belinda, she was born around 1957. In 1959, The family moved to Bondi, where they rented a ground floor apartment or a flat, as they're called in places like Australia. Basil was often away, as you might have guessed by the aforementioned occupation of traveling salesmen, and Frida was home with the children. To quote directly from Wikipedia, quote, Bondi Beach was a working class suburb throughout most of the 20th century, with migrant people from New Zealand comprising the majority of the local population. Following World War II, Bondi Beach and the eastern suburbs became home for Jewish migrants from Poland, Russia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Germany, end quote. It looked like a really nice place to live. Like, all the suburb areas I've seen in the beaches just look beautiful. It also looks like a good place to go out to eat, but I don't know if I'm right in thinking this or not. Just, like, lots of sauce-heavy, carb-heavy Eastern European food, like pierogies. I ate a lot of fried cheese and potato pancakes and dumplings in the Czech Republic. I don't know. Do you think, does Bondi have, like, really good Jewish delis and abundance of places to get starchy foods, or is it all... Is it all like surfing in smoothies now? <laughs> Do you know? I bet one of our listeners knows. Honestly, I doubt you get a lot of starchy food there. But I also, I haven't been in like 15 years or so. And also, I I wouldn't call it nowadays a, a working class suburb. It changed. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. I just like, are there good pierogies though? Does anybody <laughs> know? looks like a beautiful area, and it is in this area that Basil and Frida are now raising their children. In 1960, so a year after they moved to Bondi, their eldest daughter, Cheryl, she is the one with special needs. She lived, I believe, a little bit north of them in a care home, and Frida was home with their son, Graham, who was eight, and Belinda was three. They were not a wealthy family, but they were very respectable, middle-class, hardworking people. They didn't own their own home, and this is mentioned in a lot of articles in a way that makes me think that it's probably a goal that would have been out of reach for them, right? Which is the case for lots of people. Yeah. Maybe most people, probably. But yeah, Basil had occasionally bought tickets for this lottery before, and he'd even won a few of the smaller amounts. Like, I think he won five pounds back, like what he spent back again a couple times. And I think he'd won 10 pounds once, but he'd never won the really big award and definitely not the grand prize of 100,000. So... Everything was going to change for them, though. On Wednesday, June 1st, 1960, they pulled the winning number for the 10th lotto, and it's number 3932. Basil has won the grand prize, £100,000. And again, you read it as somewhere between like 3 to $5 million in today's money. Definitely life-changing money, right? Yep. So his photograph holding the winning ticket was published on the front page of the newspaper, and there's an article about who he was and where he lived with his wife, and here's pictures of his two children, and here's 
here's their names and all the other information. And they had done that with all the previous nine winners before. The article even said that they were going to get their money. The money would be in their hands by July 7th. So that seems a bit risky. Right? Yeah. I know. And I think part of that was an attempt to maintain transparency because it was such a big lot. Like this lottery program mm. was so vital to this building project. And I think initially the New South Wales government just really wanted all the winners listed so people could see there wasn't any funny business, right? And really the biggest issue with the previous nine winners and initially with the Thorns to come from this sort of publicity about them having won the grand prize was there was some stress on two fronts, right? So not the phone, because they didn't actually have a phone yet when they won, although they did sign up then to have one installed. But they did have issues with mail and also the doorbell mm. or the door knocker, right? So desperate, tragic letters arriving from all over the place from people begging for financial help and also reporters just knocking on the door day and night trying to get interviews. So that's all going to be – that's stressful. So one night – A man knocks on the door and he tells Frida, who is kind of, I imagine she's sort of given him the side eye because I think that people bothered them a lot, but not usually like after dinner. And so I imagine just Frida giving this man the side eye and he tells Frida that he was a private investigator and he's looking for a man by the name of Bogner. And she tells him she doesn't know anyone by that name. It's certainly not the name of the family that was in the flat before them. So then he's like, well, is this telephone for you? number for you correct and now she's really giving him the side eye and she's like well that is our number but although they'd ordered the phone line after the lottery win and they'd had the handset installed it wasn't connected yet and so she's like we're not connected yet how do you yeah. why, like how do you have this number and he's like i'm a private investigator i have ways of finding this sort of information so i think really he just called the operator and they told him everything because That's how things used to yeah. be, right? I mean, this is 1960, but in my childhood, I think it's only recently that this isn't a thing anymore where you could call 411. So like, what's the 411? Meaning like, what's the info? What's the information? Comes from, you could call 411 on your phone and it was an operator. And I think it was like a five cent charge. And you could say, I'm looking for John Smith in Boston. And they'd say, all right, we have John A. Smith on Huntington, John Andrew Smith on Dartmouth, John B. Smith on Commonwealth, and they would spend the time going through the phone book, basically, until you figured out the address or the phone number that you needed. And they'd either give you the number or you could pay another dime or whatever and just get connected. Do you remember this? Did you have something similar in Austria? We had the phone information, but you barely called there because... I mean, you called there if you had to call in another city or... Uh, mm -hmm. state because you just usually had the phone book from your state, like Lower Austria yeah, or Vienna right. or so that's when you would call the the phone info hotline. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. Anyway, back then, I think that's how he got it all. He just called the operator and they gave him all the information. But what the private investigator, or supposed private investigator, I should say, does is he's then pretty smart and he implies to Frida that it's like, oh, well, this is a marital matter. So now she's uncomfortable thinking someone's having an affair and she doesn't want any part of this. And he says he'll go upstairs and talk to the upstairs neighbors and see if they know where he might find Mr. Bogner and sorry for bothering you and And that's it. He's gone and quickly enough forgotten. So some weeks pass as usual. Basil is still working with his father. I think he hadn't actually planned on stopping work even after the lottery win. I think he had intended to keep on working with his father, but maybe more of the proceeds going to his father. But every day, Frida packs up Graham's lunch, and she ties his little school uniform tie, and off he goes with his school case. And it's just a couple hundred yards. It's like two blocks away to a corner where he's picked up by another local mom and taken to school. And then once Graham's out for the day, Frida would usually take uh, three-year-old Belinda into town to do the shopping. Then on Thursday, July 7th, it's a winter morning in Australia, and the routine is the same. So Graham... As usual, he leaves for school at 8.30 in the morning. One of his friends saw him walking along the route. He always went 
to to get his carpool pickup. Like I said, it was only a couple of blocks from his family's flat. He liked to leave early, apparently, because he got picked up right near a corner store, and he liked to go in and say hi to the shop owner and get some potato chips. And I'm also guessing that this little luxury was since the lottery win, but I'm I'm not sure. You also get the impression that he's Just a smart and outgoing boy. He seems like a really sweet kid. And then he'd wait for Mrs. Smith to arrive with, I think it was, she had two sons and then there was another kid as well as Graham that she drove to school every morning. But on that morning, on July 7th, Mrs. Smith, she stops at the corner of Wellington and O'Brien as usual at 8.40, but there's no sign of Graham. And so she pulls up a little bit to get out of the way of traffic and she has one of her boys hop out of the car and look for him. And, you know, thinking maybe the shop was busy and he was still trying to buy his chips Mm. or, you know, just anything reasonably explainable. But no, the shopkeeper hasn't seen him. And when they can't find him, Mrs. Smith gets the kids back into the car and she heads right to the family's flat on Edward Street, which is great because I was just... It's funny doing research on this. I was just surprised how relieved I was that she wasn't just like, well, he's probably sick, you know, and just went on to school without checking. Yeah, thank God she, she seemed to be responsible. A responsible yeah, mom. Yeah, really responsible. Yeah. So she goes to Graham's house and she uh, talks to Frida, who hasn't left yet for the day, and she confirms that he's not there. And so now they're a little bit worried, but they're not in a panic, not yet. And so Phyllis then takes the kids to school, where she goes in to see if someone else had maybe collected him and brought him there, but no. So she drives back to Frida's, and now their hopes are just dashed mm. because there's just no sign of him. They don't know where he is. And so Frida immediately contacts the Bondi police. And so this is also great because at this point, Graham has been gone for less than an hour and the police are on their way. Yeah, that's good. There are so many cases where a family doesn't know that the child has gone missing until they don't come home from school or, you know, they don't come home from the relatives or whatever. Here, they at least realized that he was missing very quickly and the police were there within an, an hour or so. Because they always say, right, the police says uh, it's so important that... Time is of the essence. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so Sergeant Larry O'Shea, he is the first one to arrive. When he's there at 9.40 in the morning, the phone rings. So that's an hour from when Mrs. Smith would have normally picked him up. So really, this is a solid time frame from an investigative standpoint. So the phone rings and Frida immediately hands the phone to Sergeant O'Shea. He's pretending to be Basil, the man of the house, right? And of course, Basil is away on a business trip. And Officer O'Shea, here's a man with a fairly heavily accented voice saying that he has Graham, he's kidnapped him, and he's demanding 25,000 pounds by 5 p.m. Or he says that he's going to feed Graham to the sharks. So this is awful. I mean, this is beyond awful. And I think this threat was particularly frightening because when his parents were around his age, there had been two fatal shark attacks within a month at Bondi. And I'm sure at that age, they would have remembered it. Yeah, that's an impressionable age. And it's an awful threat. But I remember that really in Sydney, they talk a lot about shark attacks. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. I remember I was on a speedboat taking a tour. And every time we saw a really lovely deserted beach area and we ask well there are no people there and it's like there was a shark attack like last year or two years ago and you have all these uh, nets in the water yes there are nets at bondi yep they put nets up at bondi i think in the late 30s as a result of these two attacks so i can understand that that's a horrible threat for parents in that area oh it's terrifying and that is really one of the scariest It is, I mean, listen, there's a lot of ways I don't want to die, and there's a lot of ways I don't want people I love to die, and eaten by a shark is right up there. That threat is like movie villain level. Right? It's awful. It's awful. Back to the ransom call. Sergeant Larry O'Shea has been apparently living, been living under a rock. He's like me. He's like, what's going on? (laughs) So he has no idea that the family are recently wealthy by the state of where they live, right? I think it was just a small two-bedroom flat. Mm Mm-hmm. And so his immediate reaction when the stranger is demanding what today I think would be at least half a million dollar ransom, he's like, how am I going to get that kind of money? Mm. Right? Which probably tipped the kidnapper off maybe to the fact that it was a cop. Or he might have thought they were pretending not to have the money. Either way, he hangs up without much more info. So O'Shea, he's like, oh, well, I don't want to put thoughts into his head. But I imagine that he's like, oh, 
for the love of God. So he immediately phones the police station to let them know this situation is happening, it's serious, and he's going to need some assistance, right? So the search started pretty much right away. They searched all the houses and apartments in the area. They just searched everything, hotels, motels, even out to the boat moorings on Sydney Harbor, but they had no luck. There was absolutely no sign of Graham. But the newspapers found out about the kidnapping, like the Badger murders in Wakefield that we covered. And so by that afternoon, it was all over the newspapers, and people were shocked. There wasn't even a law on the books for kidnapping for ransom in Australia at that time because it had never happened. It was something that only happened in other countries to, like, wealthy celebrity families like the Lindberghs, Mm. right? It just, this is not something that happens in Australia. So Colin Delaney, he was, it could be Delaney, he was the police commissioner for New South Wales, and he went on the evening news, as did Basil, and it's really hard to to watch. Basil only manages to briefly beg the kidnapper to send his son back to him in one piece, and he breaks down before he's able to, you know, finish speaking and finish giving his statement. Frida, who I believe was heavily medicated, thank God, was also quoted as saying, and this will not surprise anyone, that the kidnapper could have everything. They could have the entire lottery winnings. They didn't care. They just wanted their child home safe. That must be one of the worst things for parents and then you think you have this super lucky thing happening to you that changes your whole life that you win the lottery and and win so much money and then that causes the most horrible thing that could happen to you right i know i can't even imagine and especially i i think and again i don't want to put my sense and i apologize if i'm wrong if the family is listening but everything i read seemed to imply that they weren't really going to make a lot of big life changes i think they were very excited that this meant that their eldest daughter who had a lot of disabilities would be taken care of after they were gone but well, i guess it was just that they knew they had some stability now and they didn't have to worry anymore yes. yeah mm-hmm. that's it and most of that revolved around their children and their family They needed the money, you know. It's just so sad. So that night at 9.47 p.m., the kidnapper calls the Thorn House again, and another officer answers the phone, and this time the kidnapper gives instructions that the money should be put into two paper bags, and then the man hangs up the phone without saying anything else, where the money should be left or any other kind of useful information. And he wasn't on long enough for a trace, which is what they were hoping for. He also never called back, but lots of other people did. So that's when people started calling them, pretending to be the kidnapper, hoping for money. And then they had people, and this is so strange to me again, the situation where you have well-known people were suddenly offering to be their intermediary with the kidnappers. I just, it seems so weird to me, doesn't it? It's weird, right? Like just random people inserting themselves into kidnapping cases. Yeah, humans are very weird. And I get to that conclusion all the time. So much more since we're doing that podcast. Like know, humans right? are so weird. It's just weird. So this poor family, it's bad enough. They've got this image of their son being fed to the sharks and the kidnapper won't tell them where to leave the money that they are very willing to give. And now people are, for both admirable and shameful reasons, just hounding them mm. relentlessly. It's awful. Yeah, I'm sure some people just really meant good. Like they had good intentions, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I would always think, why would I bother these people? There must be so many people trying to help. Like, it's not like I'm the only person who is so great at helping them. You know what I mean? I'm not their last chance or their last hope. And I know that I'm somebody who is, I'm probably super annoying if I feel like I'm trying to help because I probably do it wrong and get it wrong. And all the time, it's like, it's like when the dog tries to help me fold laundry. It's not, it's not good. But It's just some of these people, it's like, is there just no thought? I just wonder if they just want to be part of the story. You know what I mean? Or maybe they want, I I don't know if, maybe there were some people who thought they would then get a reward. Oh, a reward. You help us get our kids back, of course, we give you lots of money, like for example. And there Mm -hmm. are rewards. Well, we'll get into that more. So the good news is that there was a massive search that was launched like immediately. And it was at that time the largest in Australian history. All police leave is canceled. No vacation for anybody. Get your ass back to the station. Police, military, even the local scoutmasters in the area. I can't remember. I swear I read or heard.
heard something that the scout masters in New South Wales, like they kind of, they figured this is something their scouts could do. So they like took to the woods and other areas that searchers might not reach, which is awesome. Like Mm. that's a great use. Yeah. And there were rewards. So there was an uh, initially an award of 5,000 pounds. And then there was a second reward offered in the amount of 15,000 pounds. And that was offered by two newspapers, which at that time, it was probably blood money anyway, because they're making money hand over fist, publishing every detail of, you know, not to blame the media, but ouch. The next day, so July 8th at 6 p.m., they find their first real clue. They find Graham's empty school case, and it was found near Wakehurst Parkway. This is a pretty busy highway that cuts through what at that time was just bushland, but today it is part of the, am I going to pronounce this right, Garigal National Park, heading towards Sydney's northern beaches. And so this is an aside that I can't not mention. I looked up Wakehurst Parkway, just trying to get even just the most basic tentative grasp on the geography of the area because I'm so bad at it. And what do I find? Murders, body dump sites, and a haunted highway. The worst thing I read is that when you're on this Wakehurst Parkway, apparently the most common one is this ghost lady who suddenly appears in your car. And it's a girl ghost. And if you do not tell her that she is unwelcome, so you've got to tell that ghost to fuck right off or she'll crash your car. Isn't that nuts? But if you're like, hello, or, (laughs) well, you're in Australia. So you'd be like, oh, good day. No worries. But if you'd rack off, that'd be lovely. Thanks. And she just vanishes and you're fine. So that's good times. Wouldn't Australians just call her a cunt? Well, they might. And I think that's a fair description. She just fucking appears in your car and crashes it. Seriously. It reminds me of those Austrian ghost episodes that we did in October. It really seems that there are these hitchhiking ghosts all over the world, right? Yeah. Write us about your highway ghosts, please. Because I've got that highway bookmarked now for a different future episode, but I just couldn't not mention it. So it's right off this highway where they find a a man finds Graham's empty school bag. And it seems like probably it was thrown from a car. And then within hours of them finding this bag, the search is on again, and it's in this area. And there were hundreds of police and army units, tracking dogs, helicopters, you name it. We've got some pictures of the search, and it is impressive. And as As a result of this search, on July 11th, Graham's school cap, his raincoat, his lunch bag, which still had his apple in it, and his math books were found along the other side of the highway. And this was only about a mile or one and a half kilometers from where they had found his school bag. But there was still no sign of Graham. And we are going to talk evidence, more evidence, in just a moment. But I feel like this is probably a good time to take a quick pause and tell our listeners that this episode a Fresh Hell podcast is brought to you by Yarn. Yarn offers everything true crime from their chat fiction stories to choose your own adventure experiences and now full audio dramas. Uh, Yarn is an interactive storytelling app where stories are told as text messages between main characters. Genres range from romance to comedy, horror to action and more. And it also offers video and audio only episodes to watch and or listen to on your phone in just a few minutes. Tap through the most addictive and immersive stories today only on Yarn. So download it today to watch, read and listen Listen to all your favorite fiction stories, from steamy to horror. Yarn has it all. Millions, yes, you heard it right, millions have already binged some of their top series Mystery Dog, Modern Dating and Haunted Camper. A haunted camper? Where do I sign up? Download Yarn for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's Yarn, Y-A-R-N. All right, so... Let's talk about preliminary evidence and what they found. On the morning of the kidnapping, there were several witnesses who reported that there was a 1955 iridescent blue Ford Custom Line seen in the area. So many witnesses remembered and reported it because it was double parked and therefore an extra and unexpected pain in their ass that morning. See? Don't be, don't be a dick and people are less likely to remember you. Yeah, don't be that person. So it was parked at the corner of Francis and Wellington Street, which was Graham's usual place to meet Mrs. Smith. And so just a horde of police descend upon the DMT, which is Australia's Department of Motor Transport, and 
of the 260,000 Ford index cards they have to go through, they narrow it down to 4,000 cars that might match the description. So they were certainly, of course, doing everything possible to find Graham. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that I watched, I think it was an episode of, there's an Australian program called Crime Investigation, and the YouTube link to it will be in our sources because it's great. And two things they mentioned that were really fun. One was that one of the guys, one of the men who was a witness at the time, he had told them what kind of car it was. And it really, for some reason, it reminded me of the courtroom scene in My Cousin Vinny, because I guess that night they got him in a police car and they drove him all around town and they were like, what's that car? And what's that car? And what's that car? And he could name all the cars. And so then they believed him (laughs) that he definitely knew the kind of car that he had seen, which was kind of smart. Also in this program, they were saying how police enlisted the help of just everyone they could get, including big names in organized crime. I guess organized crime was really big in Sydney at that time. And so there is a, yeah, in that same, it's in that same crime investigation video that I was talking about. And, you know, in it, they're talking to a retired police officer and he's saying that the organized crime factions, they were as keen to catch the kidnappers as the police were. Everyone was really angry about this. So it seems the cops were sharing what little information they had with the heads of these crime families because they did believe that if one of the families discovered who had done it, they'd turn him over to the police. So I just thought that was really interesting, but I did not go down that rabbit hole because um, reasons. That's interesting. It reminds me of the German movie M by Fritz Lang, which I can highly recommend if you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I will add it to the list. So Frida also tells police about the strange encounter that she had had with this self-proclaimed private eye, right? He had had her number, he spoke with her upstairs neighbors, and then left. And that wasn't long after the lottery win had been announced. At this point, police were staying with the Thorns. They were sleeping at their house just to make sure that they had, just to kind of help protect them from, that sounds wrong, because protect, not so much from physical violence, but just from from the outside world a little bit. You know what I mean? From the emotional yes. torment also, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. They were really living up to the serve and protect that we want in our police force. They were, they were doing it. And they were there. And they were there to answer the phone if anybody called. And they were there to make sure people shuffled along and moved their cars if looky-loos were showing up. All that kind of stuff. And other witnesses also reported seeing a man that they described as having an olive complexion and a heavy accent. Then, on Tuesday, August 16th, almost six weeks after Graham was kidnapped, a group of boys playing in a vacant lot in Grandview Grove, which is in Seaforth, a suburb that's about 20 kilometers or a little over 12 miles north of Bondi. They were playing in a vacant lot and they noticed again this blue plaid blanket that's sort of tied up and tucked into this sort of niche in a large rock. I have a photo of the rock. It's not graphic. It's after the blanket was removed, but you'll see what I mean when you see the photo. There's just sort of a, a ledge like a natural ledge almost built into the rock. And this blanket had been there for a few weeks without really them paying it much mind. But finally, a couple of them mentioned it in passing to their mothers who were immediately like, you tell your father about this the moment he gets home. And then when the fathers got home, they went to the spot where the blue rug was, which by the way, so rug is another term for like a lap blanket or a picnic blanket. I always feel silly explaining this stuff because obviously some people know it, but I had to learn it all. So I'm assuming some people also are in the boat that I was in. So like if you're in a wheelchair in Great Britain or other Commonwealth nations and it's wintertime or fall and you're chilly, you're going to be looking for a nice rug to put over your knees. I have them from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Usually here in the States, a rug means like a carpet that's not wall to wall. Um, And there are a lot of cases, obviously, where someone is wrapped up in a rug, right? Meaning like a carpet. But in this Mm. case, I'm talking about a rug, like a small blanket, like a picnic blanket, right? All right. So the dads go down to take a look at this parcel wrapped in a rug. And I think they're probably very quickly horrified and realize very likely what they may have found, and they phone the police. The police arrive immediately, and they remove the wrapped up blanket and untie it. And I think, as we all expect, they found the body of the missing eight-year-old boy. And this was only about a mile from where his school case was found. 
Horrible. Yeah. It's horrible. It's awful. And what's worse, a police officer was sent to notify Basil and Frida, but they found out about it on the news before the police officer had made it to the house. Again, like the Wakefield case, which is extra devastating because you want this sad news to be delivered in person by mm -hmm. a kind person not to have them hear it over the news like what's that That's i know i know it's awful and i think on some level they must have expected it with such a time period passing and just nothing more from the kidnapper but i think also you would just you have to kind of keep that hope alive right so of course ugh, yeah. it's heartbreaking all right so now let's talk about all the stuff that the investigation got right, because there's a lot here. This is this is really a case where it's awful, awful, awful in the sense that it ever happened. But it's, I don't want to say it's, I don't know what the right word is. There's a comfort in knowing that I really do think in this case, everybody in the position to do things about it did what they were supposed to do. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. There's yeah. so many cases where somebody goes missing and it's like two weeks before police will even consider the fact they might not be a runaway. No. You know what I mean? So it's just nice that in this case, everybody was working so hard. Also, it needs to be mentioned that for a lot of the forensics, this was really groundbreaking stuff at the time. So when Graham was found, he was wearing his school uniform. He was only missing one shoe. His hands and feet had been tied with rope and there was a silk scarf that was knotted tightly around his neck. His stomach contents proved that he had died no more than 48 hours after his abduction. And they believed also uh, from the evidence that his body had been left there on that rock ledge soon afterwards. So like the Lindbergh baby, he died the same day he was kidnapped. So they found evidence of both uh, asphyxiation of suffocation. There was petechia in his like eyes and throat and lungs. So they believe that suffocation, but they also weren't sure whether or not a blow to the head might have been responsible. So those were the two possibilities of what might have happened. They found soil evidence specifically. They studied soil samples that they had found on the rug and on the body, and they found tiny traces of a pink limestone mortar. They also found two different types of cypress foliage. There were like little twigs and things like stuck to the, because it was a wool rug, right? So everyone with wool, you know how everything sticks if it's on the ground. So yeah, they had found this foliage and it was two different types. And these plants were not found anywhere in the area where the body was found. One of them was a pretty common species of cypress, but the other one was more rare and less commonly found. There was also mold on his shoes, which indicated that he had been wrapped in the wool blanket and sort of left there immediately. Do you know what I mean? Like he hadn't really mm. been... Right. The blanket was made by... And I'm afraid I'm going to pronounce this wrong. I'm going to say Unka Paringa. I meant to ping Sarah or Heather or some of our other Aussie friends in the Facebook group with pronunciation questions, but this week was... It was a week. But they made gorgeous wool blankets and... So this this wool blanket that he's wrapped in, it was somewhat traceable in and of itself. And they found more evidence. They found dog hair that they identified as belonging to a Pekingese dog. And they find bleached blonde human hair. So now police were searching for a house in the general area with two different types of cypress growing, some pink limestone mortar somewhere in the mix. And maybe there would be a metallic blue Ford sedan in the driveway now and again. And who do you think was able to find that house? It was the local postman, a local postal carrier. <laughs> so shout out to all the mail carriers out there. But he was like, oh yeah, there's a house on Moore Street in Clontarf that sounds exactly like that. There's two cypress trees flanking the drive and everything. Sure enough, October 3rd, they follow this lead into a house in Clontarf. It's in the northern Sydney suburbs. It's about three kilometers from where Graham's body was found. So on the 3rd of October, they go to this house and they learn it had been rented by a man named Stephen Bradley with his second wife, Magda and their three children, but they had moved out, they had sold the car and a lot of their possessions and moved to Manly. But police were able to track down the car they sold as well as a vacuum cleaner that they sold and they took possession of both. So then they went to the house in Manly that they had moved to after Clontarf and at that house, that was Bradley's last known address, they find, of all things, film. 
And so they have the photos enlarged, and in them are photographs including one of the bleached blonde Mrs. Bradley and their children sitting what appeared to be the same blanket that Graham's body was wrapped in. There were also photographs of Stephen Bradley himself. Police also found the car, and they took samples from the trunk, and I mentioned that vacuum cleaner, and they do. They find the hairs from Cherry, who was the family Pekingese, in the vacuum and in the car, and probably everywhere, as anyone with a dog knows. (laughs) And now they also had a little bit of a problem, because Bradley and his family had left Australia on September 26th, sailing for London aboard the SS Himalaya, but fortunately, the Sydney police were able to beat them to port when it stopped in Colombo. And after a long jurisdictional back and forth over who had, you know, jurisdictional rights, he was brought back to Sydney for trial. So let's talk just a little bit about Stephen Bradley. He had been interviewed briefly at the end of August because he was on the list of cars that they had compiled, but he explained he was moving on the day that the boy disappeared and it just couldn't have been him. And, you know, that was that. I think that was true, actually. I think he took the opportunity of the day that they moved from their house in Clontarf to Manly, I think, is the day that the kidnapping happened. And his name was, I was just going to say Americanized, but anglicized would be the more correct term, wouldn't it? He had emigrated from Hungary and... So this uh, upcoming information, it's from an article by Stephen Garton in the Australian Dictionary of Biography, Volume 13. So I've edited out last names for privacy, but Bradley arrives in Melbourne in 1950 as a divorcee. And so to quote Garton, quote, he found jobs as a life insurance salesman, male nurse, and as an electroplater at a poker machine factory. On March 1st, 1952, he married Eva Marie. Maria at the Presbyterian Church in Gardner. They had one daughter before Eva was killed in an accident on the 26th of February, 1955. Istvan was his original birth name, and he changed his name by deed poll to Stephen Leslie Bradley in August of 1956. So after his wife died, he changed his name. In November of 1957, Bradley was charged with false pretenses in Sydney, but the charge was allowed to lapse. On 8th of December, 1958, he married a Hungarian divorcee with two children who owned a boarding house at Katoomba. In 1959, the guest house burned down, but he failed to make any money on the insurance settlement. He lived beyond his means. He was short, stocky, dark-haired, and balding. He dressed well, and he liked to drive big cars. Prison authorities subsequently described him as tense, insecure, and intelligent, with a sociable and engaging personality, but also deemed him a hopeless liar, a confidence man, and an opportunist who was desperate to make money quickly. Frustrated at his circumstances, he brought his family to Sydney, determined to, quote, do something big. In June 1960, after the report that Basil Thorne of Bondi had won first prize in the Sydney Opera House lottery, Bradley hatched his plan to kidnap the Thorne's only son, eight-year-old Graham, end quote. It's so basic. It's like the plot of a bad movie. The threat of the feeding to the shark just fits perfectly to the character, apparently. I know. It's just so greedy. So greedy and... It, money can just bring out the worst in people. And jealousy, I guess, more than any. It wasn't even money. It's jealousy, isn't it, in this case? I have to ask, was he a suspect in his first wife's death? So... Not officially, but some people did think that he was suspicious. Hang on one second, because I know I have an article on this. Okay. So in 2015, there's an article by Andrew Kubaridis. Uh, I hope I've pronounced that right. He wrote an article for the Herald Sun about this case and a new book at the time, Kidnapped, which I haven't been able to read yet. It wasn't available on Kindle. So I'm just going to read to you really quickly from this article because I want to make sure I get it right. So, quote, Now a startling new book on the crime not only examines Australia's first child kidnapping, but includes new suggestions Bradley may have also killed his second wife. The author of the new book, Kidnapped, is Mark Tedeschi, QC, New South Wales Senior Crown Prosecutor, who scrutinized the trial transcripts, the police brief, witness statements, and media coverage of what was considered the trial of the 20th century. In it, he outlines the mysterious death of the wife after her car brakes failed. The tragic accident came after Bradley came into a considerable amount of money through the marriage. Mr. Tedeschi told ABC's Late Line last night he entered into 
to some conjecture about the possibility Bradley was involved in his wife's death, but conceded there was no direct evidence of it. Quote, but it was a mysterious accident. The police were suspicious. His then father-in-law was extremely suspicious about the death of his daughter. The police did investigate, but didn't have enough evidence to charge anyone. And that was the end of the matter. He was never charged. End quote. Asked on Late Line if he believed the crash would be better investigated if it had happened today, Mr. Tedeschi replied, Absolutely. I'm sure the motor vehicle accident units of police forces around Australia today would have a much better idea if her car was tampered with. End quote. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what to think about it. I think it's interesting that he also didn't change his name formerly until after his first wife's death. Yeah. That could be coincidence, but I mean, I think we can safely say he would maybe kill someone just for money. In the case of Graham, I agree with what most of people, I think including Tedeschi, he has got a lot of articles linked to our sources. But I think it was an accident because as soon as Graham died, he's kidnapped him for nothing. If the end goal was money, right, then and I don't know. I think he was some, like, what's the, what's the opposite of evil mastermind? Like, what's... Well, the opposite of... It's simpleton. <laughs> yeah. The evil version of that. Valuichi. <laughs> he just... I don't know. It just seems like he saw Basil's, like... It's funny when you see the picture of Basil's face on the front page of the paper, because he's got this look of... It's like he can't believe it happened. It's such a lovely photo. And for some reason, this man saw this photo and thought that because he had been through so much, he had to survive the Second World War and then emigrate. And that was very hard. And then no one can pronounce his name. And then his first wife died, leaving him a single father. And he just felt like he deserved the money more. Like he'd been through more, he deserved it. Like, that's how life works, right? Do we know, did he have a lottery ticket? I don't know if that? he ever bought a lottery ticket. No, I don't know. As far as I know, he didn't ever buy a lottery ticket. He had, though, read an article in a newspaper about another very big kidnapping in Europe that had happened. And so I think that's maybe what gave him the idea. So the way I imagine it, the way it's been described, is sort of like there was a a row of, like, houses and apartments and things, and then, like, a sidewalk and a street and then a park. And on the park, there was a bench – and apparently, he sat there on that bench for like, I don't, it could have been weeks. It was certainly days. But he sat there and just watched the family every day to learn their routine, to learn what their norm was. Mm. He was, of course, the one who pretended to be the private investigator. Frida recognized him immediately. So bold. I know. That's so bold. I know. Yeah. yeah. And he had done that because, of course, he needed to have their number. Like, you can't kidnap someone if you can't get in touch with them for the ransom, right? Mm. And there is one, one of the things I read said that one of the What's the word? Crime historians in Australia, I think, believes that initially, probably he planned to take their much younger daughter because she would have been easier to deal with and probably wouldn't have put up a fight and also wouldn't be able to describe him in any way. But because watching the family, of course, he realizes that she's never unattended, right? She's like with her mother all the time. So all of a sudden, Graham's two block walk to get to his ride for school was his chance. So he picked him up where Mrs. Uh, Smith would usually pick him up, saying that she was sick and he was his ride. And then once they got out of town, he pulled over, he tied Graham up, put him in the trunk, and then he called the house with the ransom demand from the payphone. That was that first phone call. And he claimed in his confession to the police, he did confess when he was being brought back to Australia, he did confess. But he claimed that the boy's death was accidental, that he had suffocated in the trunk. He had opened the, the trunk and found him already dead. And it was an accident. And it was terrible. And that the head wound must have just been from him hitting the head maybe where the spare tire was or something. But the police didn't didn't believe that. And like, as we said before, they know it was either suffocation or blunt force trauma. They just, they weren't sure exactly what was the cause of death, but they knew it wasn't an accident. Sorry, but I just, why did he not, the, the, what was it, a scarf or a string or whatever, mm -hmm. so tightly around the boy's neck? Like, why? My suspicion is that the scarf around his neck was initially used as a gag around his mouth and shoved into his mouth. And I think it's very possible that he may have asphyxiated from the gag in his mouth in the car. And then when Bradley opened the trunk 
and found him possibly brain damaged unconscious. I think he realized he thought he was dead and tried to finish him off by strangling him. And I think when that didn't work, he hit him in the head and just called it a day, I think. I hope that he fell asleep very quickly. He does mention that he, I think he did mention in one of the things I read that he hit him over the head to just sort of like knock him out initially. So that's my other hope is that he was just not out cold when all of this went down and he just didn't suffer at all. But it's just, again, like the Lindbergh baby, he was, he was gone that day. And Stephen Bradley, he never really expressed any real remorse. He was sentenced to life in prison in March of 1961. His wife divorced him a couple of years later. Some sources do wonder if she had anything to do with it. There were a lot of sightings. There's a lot of stuff I did not cover. That would have been my next question. Yeah. I don't think... I don't know. I just don't know. But my suspicion is if they did do this on the... If the kidnapping was on the day that they moved, I could absolutely see... Because he had said the wife and kids had already, you know, started unpacking and he was going back and forth bringing stuff. So you Mm -hmm. could easily take that extra time if you thought it was going to be a quick kidnap him in the morning, get the money that night, be done with it, right? I think he really thought that's what would happen. But I mean, it's a (laughs) stupid... I mean, obviously, I it's a stupid plan, but you kidnap a kid, you have to take care of that kid for at least a couple of days until you get that ransom money. Right. And you're in the middle of a move and you have your family with three three kids, right? And the yeah. wife at home. Yeah. yeah. What he was didn't... he thinking he's going to do with the kid? Well, I don't think he, I don't think he gave it any real, I mean, that's a problem, right? I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't an evil genius. He gave it enough thought to sit there for days or even weeks to watch the family. So it's not like it was in a spur of a moment kind of decision to kidnap that boy. No, but I think that his entire, I think the entirety of his thinking was focused on him and himself. He never thought Mm. about the boy, right? It was all him, 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 him. And I think that's partly why everything failed because he didn't, he didn't take the time to make like anything I do, the most basic fucking shit. It's like, I have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. This guy didn't even really have a plan A. He spent a lot of time thinking about how he might not get caught and almost no time thinking about actually executing anything. I mean, then they ran off. What do you tell your wife? They just moved to Manly and then you're like, you know what, we're leaving Australia. <laughs> I like- know. I don't know. I don't know. I I did read that... So she was, so the three kids that they had, one of them was his daughter from the fir- his first marriage mm. from when his wife that we think maybe he murdered died. Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Allegedly. The other two children were his wife's children from her previous marriage. And I will say, I read in a couple of places that one of her children had some sort of special needs situation and that he was very, very good with the children. That he was very mm-hmm. loving and that he treated he treated her children like his children. Like he treated all of the children equally and was good to the children. If I've misread that or I'm misremembering or if it's like a fiction of my own head, please let me know if I got that wrong. But I think that could also explain why she was like, okay, also at that time in the 1960s, the man was very much the head of the household, right? So if your yeah. husband's like, I got a job, we're all moving to London. I got a gr-. He yeah, probably yeah. said like- We don't I've question got a-, a lot. Yeah, because that's if he had gotten the money, then then that would explain it, right? Like, I got this great job in London, and we're all moving, and then he's got this money that they can live, you know what I mean? So I think she would have believed, I think it's possible that she had no involvement and just didn't want to see what was happening there. Yeah. Plus, it was only one day, remember, because he, so the lot where he left the body was actually a lot he had looked at and considered buying at one point. So that's how he was connected to where the body was found. But yeah, so... He ended up in prison. He was sentenced to life in prison. And he died in prison in 1968. And this is, it's a little bit annoying because he dropped dead of a heart attack after a game of tennis. Raise your hand if you've never murdered anyone and can't afford to play tennis. It's so weird to me. It's not like I want prisoners Mm -hmm. to be like last week. I don't want everyone to be shanked up with their leg shackles, you know, but also... Tennis? I think they did have to keep him separate, though. I think he did have quite a few beatings from the regular inmates because he killed a child. Yeah, probably. And it was such a... High profile. Yeah, and all the the criminals, you know, organized crime tried to solve the case with the police. So they That's knew right. 
Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So he was sort of sequestered away from everybody. And yeah, he died after a game of tennis at the age of 42. So after that, Australia's laws on privacy changed. Thank you. Kidnapping became, I say thank you, like it affects me in any way, but you know what I mean? Just progress in general as a world, (laughs) not casting shade on Australia. Kidnapping became a crime. Lottery winners could remain anonymous. And this just very, very sad case was some of the earliest types of forensics used at trial. I think especially the stomach contents showing that he had died that day and also the mold and plant info, I think was really crucial to his conviction. It's an absolutely heartbreaking case, but yes, extremely fascinating to see how this case was kind of groundbreaking for forensics. Yeah. It's amazing what those specialists can determine, right? It really is. Yeah, it really is amazing. It reminded me a little bit of Bones, which is a show we used to really like. But it's not, I don't think we've done that many cases where it's like, here's the plant evidence, and here's the soil evidence, and here's, there's a lot of interesting evidence. And this is the case that people from the Sydney area, uh, even today, you know, they'll say this is the case that changed childhood forever. Mm. There was no more running off and playing in the bush or in the woods. Parents wanted kids in the yard where they could see them. The Thorne family, they moved out of Bondi. And I haven't read much or anything really with them discussing things. And so I'm just going to leave it there and say that I'm glad we all know about this like beautiful, smart, funny child who was just taken far too soon. So Graham Thorne, we're thinking of you. Yeah, it's a sad story. I've never heard of it. Thank you. I had never heard of it either. And so I was like, all right, we need to, that was a, it was a big case in Sydney. So do you have, do you have anything good? Is there something good? (laughs) Yeah, there's something good. My (laughs) husband is here on vacation. Yay. Since Wednesday. So one week. And I posted a video in our Facebook group about, um, because Leela freaks out when he comes home. She's so happy all the time. Yeah, the noises. So cute. So yeah, that's my something good. And we've just been spending the last couple of days relaxing. Like I've been um, working on my English paper piece in quilt and he's next to me and it's just lovely. It's It's very nice. I love it. How about you? This week has been, it's been a week in America for sure. I've got two movie suggestions and a quick something good. Movies, I'm actually not sure if Paul has seen either of them and doing this case has made me remember, and now I want to watch them. I'm pretty sure I've already talked about how much I love Priscilla Queen of the Desert. That's not what I'm talking about today. The first film I want to suggest is Strictly Ballroom from 1992. Have you seen it? Ages ago. Yeah. I swear I saw that movie like at least thrice in the theater. I dragged friends to it who did not love it. They were like, why? Why did you bring me to this. <laughs> and I was like, because you brought me to Turner and Hooch and I'm still crying myself to sleep. No, I loved it. I love, love, loved it. It's the first, I think, of the Baz Luhrmann, like the Red Curtain trilogy. The next was Romeo and Juliet and then Moulin Rouge. I loved that movie so much. And I, I probably haven't seen it in 20 years. And so now I'm going to definitely foist it on Paul. And <laughs> the other one that I want to recommend is Muriel's Wedding. Have you seen Muriel's Wedding? Yes. Did you do you hate both these movies? It's okay if you do. I don't hate them. I think they're I want to watch what they are. <laughs> I know they're both from the early 90s. So, I want to go back and watch Muriel's Wedding again, but that's also I think that's the first movie where I saw Tony Collette and it's also got oh, what's her name? Rachel um Griffith, is that right? She was in 6 Feet Under. It's got such a good good cast. And as well as my beloved Priscilla, the late great Australian actor Bill Hunter is in both of those movies. So those are my recommendations. My something good was I was able to do a really much needed video hangout with my BFF-iest BFF, like first day of third grade. We did an escape room with her and her husband over video chat. That's cool. It was really fun. I really needed that. She always has this very grounding presence on my life. So it was just nice to be able to see them. And yeah, it was good. All right. Thank you so much for listening. If you could do us the huge favor of leaving us a review on iTunes or I think uh, Spotify. Is it Spotify? That, uh, that are the only two places where you can leave a review. But it does help us so much because it helps other people with the same interests finding us. It so, does. Yes. Yeah. 
please. Also, because I mentioned Patreon in the beginning, if you want to join our Patreon, you can either go to patreon.com and type Fresh Hell Podcast in the search bar and we pop right up or you go to our webpage www.freshhellpodcast.com where you find the link to Patreon and to our merch store and to our Facebook and everything you need to contact us. And how is our Patreon? It's like... It's not like our usual episodes, You, we're not talking about murder, mystery and the macabre, they're just more mundane things. <laughs> yeah, they're chatty. Right now I feel like yeah. they're very awkward, but in an enjoyable way. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting easier. What else? Um, Facebook. I said I posted a video of Leela squeaking and oh. grunting her excited <laughs> because my husband came home. So join our Facebook group. You can see it there. Uh, it's a lovely group. It really is. It's the nicest group We have group a lot of, of fun people. there. We do. Yeah. We really do. Thank you so much for listening. Say hi to your pets. We love them. Yes. Hug them. Yeah. If you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.